In this video, we're going to be looking at the technique of flow cytometry and FACS, which is fluorescent activated cell sorting. We will discuss the theory behind the technique and some of the applications in the laboratory or clinic. If we want to understand what is going on inside the body at the organ or tissue level, then we have a range of techniques that we can use, ranging from x-rays, which allow us to look at bone structures or changes to the density of some soft tissues or organs, through to MRI and CT scans, which provide a more detailed image of internal structures, including the bones, organs and blood vessels. But what happens if we want to look at changes at the cellular level? Well, one experimental approach to address this is flow cytometry. So what exactly is flow cytometry? If we break flow cytometry down into three component parts, flow relates to fluids, cyto means cell, and metry refers to measurements. So flow cytometry as a whole is the analysis of the properties of cells or particles that are suspended in a liquid. If flow cytometry allows us to look at the properties of cells, what sort of things can we determine? Well, at its most basic level, we can gain information about the size and complexity or granularity of cells. By adding dyes to the sample, we can determine what stage of the cell cycle individual cells are at, or their viability, so whether they are alive, apoptotic, or dead. Using fluorescence, we can determine what cells are present in a mixture, look at changes to the expression levels of different cells or components of cells, and even sort those cells to purify individual populations with a specific combination of markers or a specific phenotype. Now that we can appreciate some of the wide-ranging applications of flow cytometry, let's investigate the underpinning theory of how the technique works. The central component of any flow cytometer is the fluidic system, which allows for the process called hydrodynamic focusing. Hydrodynamic focusing takes advantage of a property of fluids which states that two fluids differing sufficiently in either their velocity or their density will not mix. A flow cytometer utilises this property by injecting the fluid containing the sample at lower pressure into the middle of a high pressure fast moving sheath fluid, essentially creating a wall of fluid surrounding a narrow tube which is also made of fluid. That forces cells in the suspension to line up into single file. Now you may ask why we can't just use a glass tube for this. And the answer is that the tiny diameter of the tube required is beyond current manufacturing capabilities. So we use fluid instead. The second important element of a flow cytometer are the lasers and optics. Each cell in the fluid stream passes one at a time through one or more laser beams and causes some disturbance to that beam which can be detected by a range of different optical sensors. At a most basic level, we can interrogate cells based on two types of scattered light, which we call forward and side scatter. Looking at forward scatter first, which is a measure of cell size, we call this forward scatter because the detector for this parameter is placed in front of the plane of the laser beam. To prevent the detector from being blinded by the laser shining directly on it, a filter is placed directly in front of the laser to prevent it from reaching the detector. When a cell enters the path of the laser, it causes the light to scatter, and the light from the laser that is scattered around the filter can be detected by this forward scatter sensor. The bigger the cell, the greater the degree of scattering, so the amount of forward scatter is proportional to the diameter of the cell and is primarily due to diffraction around the edges of the cell. Side scatter measures how complex or how granular a cell is. The laser beam interacts with cytoplasmic components of the cell, particularly granules and the nucleus, causing the light to refract or reflect at different angles. A detector is placed perpendicular to the path of the laser and the refracted or reflected light can be captured. The higher the amount of side scatter, the greater the complexity or the granularity of the cell. Now. Just based on these two parameters, we can start to identify different populations of cells within the leukocytes, or white blood cells. This population of cells has high forward scatter and high side scatter, telling us that they are large, complex cells. Whereas this second population is much smaller and less granular, because both forward and side scatter are lower. Based on our understanding of cell morphology, we can determine that this first population is our granular sites, and the second population is our lymphocytes, 
This third population of cells that sits somewhere in between in terms of size and granularity, being our mononuclear cells. It is important to appreciate that within these different groups of cells that there is a wide range of sizes and complexities. The cells within our body are not uniform or identical. So, while we can start to tease apart the different types of leukocytes in blood just based on their size and complexity, we cannot fully differentiate between cells whose physical characteristics are extremely similar. Fortunately, flow cytometry is much more powerful than just distinguishing on size and granularity, and we can take advantage of the principles of fluorescence to further interrogate cells through labelling extra and intracellular features of the cell. To do this, we use antibodies or dyes that are highly specific for a particular feature of the cell. We can use DNA dyes to determine the cell viability, or antibodies that bind to proteins or even particular forms of proteins, such as those that have become activated or phosphorylated, that are expressed by the cells of interest. We will use antibodies binding to an extracellular protein expressed on the cell surface for this example. That antibody is then labelled with a fluorochrome, which when it passes through a laser beam is excited and emits light at a different wavelength that can be picked up by a detector that is specific to the wavelength of that emitted light. The number of different fluorochromes that can be used is largely determined by the number of lasers and number of different detectors that a flow cytometer possesses. Modern flow cytometers allow users to interrogate a cell in 20 different dimensions forward scatter, side scatter, and 18 fluorescent channels, which requires four different lasers emitting light at different wavelengths. The boundaries are continually being pushed, and machines with five and even six lasers, which can increase the number of parameters to around 50, do exist, but these machines at the time of making this video are rare and incredibly expensive. In this example setup, we are keeping things relatively simple with two lasers that emit light at different wavelengths, four fluorescent detectors, each that can detect emitted light at different wavelengths, which when combined with the forward and side scatter detectors, allows for up to six different parameters to be detected simultaneously. And this is really where the power of flow cytometry comes to the fore, speed. As the machine is capable of analysing thousands of events with multiple different parameters in just a matter of seconds, making it an incredibly powerful and effective tool. Indeed, every single one of the dots you see in this output, which we call a dot plot, is an individual cell. And notice well that you do not need to use every single individual fluorescent channel, as we shall see in the example. Let's take a look at the different components that make up the flow cytometer, as this will give us a better understanding of what is happening when we look at specific examples of its use. We've already discussed the fluidic system and forward and side scatter, so here we need to focus on the lasers, the optics or filters and detectors to see how they build up a better picture of the different cells in a population. The most complex part of this setup is the various filters and mirrors that allow light at different wavelengths to be directed to the correct detector. As an example, this first filter prevents green light from passing through it and instead diverts it off towards a detector which is specific to light at that wavelength. We can do this using a range of different types of filters called short pass, long pass and band pass filters. Short pass filters allow light at wavelength than the filter cut off to pass through and reflect light at wavelengths. So here, this short pass filter is allowing light at wavelengths shorter than red to pass through while red light is reflected off to the detector. Long pass filters work in the opposite way. They allow light that has a longer wavelength than the filter cut off to pass through, and shorter light is reflected. So in this case, the green light is reflected off to the detector. Finally, band pass filters only permit light between specific wavelengths to pass through. So this band pass filter is only permitting light at the orange wavelength to pass through, and the red and the green light is reflected. By combining these different types of filters, light at different wavelengths can be split off and directed to the appropriate detectors. But what happens when light reaches one of these detectors? Well, the detectors are often photodiodes or photomultiplier tubes or PMTs, 
which convert the light signal into an electrical signal that can be sent to the computer for interpretation to produce the flow cytometry outputs. What we can see here is a single cell labelled with a single fluorochrome that is about to enter the path of the laser. As the cell enters the laser beam, the detector starts to convert the fluorescent signal into an electrical signal, which is recorded as a voltage. The peak voltage occurs when the cell is in the centre of the laser beam, and then drops off again as the cell leaves the beam. Over time, as thousands of cells are analysed, we can start to build up a picture of how many cells express a particular marker. And this is what we can see in this histogram, with the cells on the right being positive for the surface marker, and those on the left being defined as negative for that marker. That's all fine when we just have one marker, and this can be useful if we just need to know whether a population of cells expresses a particular marker, or whether a drug treatment alters the expression of a receptor over time, for example. More commonly, however, we will use a panel of antibodies with different fluorochromes to allow us to identify specific populations of cells within a mixture, whilst being able to also measure things like cell viability or changes to protein expression over time. So how does this work? Well, let's revisit the lymphocyte population, which is this small, low granular population. Within this population of cells, we have CD4 positive helper T lymphocytes, CD8 positive cytotoxic T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes. Now, on the basis of size and complexity, we cannot separate these cells. But let's say that we want to know how many CD4 positive and CD8 positive cells there are. Well, we can stain the lymphocytes with two antibodies. One that recognises CD4, which we call anti-CD4, and this is linked in this case to a PE fluorochrome, and a second antibody, anti-CD8 fits C, which recognises CD8 and is labelled with the FIT-C fluorochrome in this example. These T lymphocytes are now labelled with different antibodies with fluorochromes that release light at different wavelengths. So we can identify our CD4 positive cells, which is this group of cells in the upper left quadrant, which we call CD4 high, CD8 low, because they have high levels of expression of CD4 and low levels of expression of CD8. We also have our CD8 positive cells, which are in this lower right quadrant, and we call these CD4 low, CD8 high. They have low levels of expression of CD4 and high levels of expression of CD8. There are two other quadrants, the lower left being CD4 low, CD8 low, so they don't express CD4 or CD8, and these are likely to be our unstained B lymphocytes. We also then have the upper right quadrant, which contains a very small number of cells that express both CD4 and CD8. We call these double positive, or CD4 high, CD8 high cells. The percentages in the quadrants are the overall numbers of cells that are contained within that quadrant compared to the total number of cells counted. And this can be quite powerful, because we can easily see the expression of a particular marker or the number of cells that express that target of interest changes. It's not only proteins that can be stained, we can also use DNA or mitochondrial dyes that provide information about the stage that a cell is at during the cell cycle, which is what we can see in this output. Cells have been stained differentially with BRDU and propidium iodide, allowing us to tell whether they are in G1, G2 or S phase of the cell cycle. We can also use propidium iodide on its own or in combination with other dyes to determine the viability or health of cells. So in this example, cells that are expressing higher levels of propidium iodide in the top right quadrant are likely to be undergoing apoptosis or already dead. You may notice as well that the cells appear smaller based on the forward scatter, which remember is a measure of cell size, and this is consistent with cells that are undergoing apoptosis as they contract in size during this physiological process. That's an overview of flow cytometry and fluorescence activated cell sorting, which is a very powerful high throughput assay that allows millions of cells to be analysed in multiple different parameters in a matter of minutes. Beyond the physical characteristics of the cells that can be determined through forward and side scatter, the addition of fluorescent probes that can be conjugated to antibodies, DNA or viability dyes allows for the detection of expression levels of cellular components, the cell viability, or the stage of the cell cycle, permitting researchers to investigate changes to cells in disease states or during different treatments.
The real power of flow cytometry is the ability to interrogate cells in multiple different dimensions simultaneously, allowing researchers to build up complex panels of antibodies and markers that can detect very subtle changes in cell populations.